preach, brother. That's the sound of the Holy Spirit. I, I, love, I love the fact that Jeffrey is here with us. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's no accident that in Lent we're talking about baptism. If you were at the Ash Wednesday service, the call to a holy Lent goes through the history of baptism in the church and how Lent was a preparation for the catechumens preparing for baptism in the earliest days of Christianity. So it doesn't surprise me that we have this first Sunday of Lent, a passage about Jesus' baptism, the importance of baptism, and the covenant of Noah which is, according to Peter, prefiguring baptism. And baptism is about change. It's about a change that happens in a moment, but then a change that also takes the rest of your life to perfect. And to my mind, there are three major things that often stand in my way when I'm trying to change significant things in my life as an individual. And I know that it holds true in my experience for when communities try to make change. The first is when we don't realize that there's a problem that needs to be rectified. You can't change something that you don't know is wrong. The second obstacle to change is when I realize that I do want to make a change, but then I somehow rationalize that it's really not that big of a deal after all. The third obstacle to change is when I'm just so scared of what the other side of that change might look like. If I'm making this change, am I going to be losing something significant that I won't be able to replace? What does the other side look like? These are the three significant obstacles to change that I can think of. There are also obstacles between us and repentance And they're the same obstacles. Repentance is just the church's fancy word for saying, turn back to God. Repentance is the first step in the process of changing and amending our lives. Now, maybe like me, you fit into one of these camps this Lent, or maybe you fit into all three, depending on the day and depending on the situation. I often fit into all three. In any case, I'd like to offer a little bit of hope And a little bit of good news, Jesus style. In our devotional that we have this year, the Ash Wednesday, the Ash Wednesday reading from C.S. Lewis really hit on this first obstacle to change, the I don't know that there's a problem. And C.S. Lewis says, Christianity simply does not make sense until you have until you faced the sort of facts I have been describing. Christianity tells people to repent and promises them forgiveness. It therefore has nothing, as far as I know, to say to people who do not know that they have nothing to repent of, and who do not feel that they need any forgiveness. It is only after you have realized that there is a real moral law, and a power behind that law, and that you have broken the law, and put yourself wrong with that power. It's only after all this and not a moment sooner that Christianity begins to talk. We have to realize what it is that we need to change, and you can't change something you don't know what it is. So in some ways, this is the toughest obstacle to change, because you don't realize there's a problem until it just smacks you in the face, and you're brought up short, and the situation is put right in front of your face. I had a situation like this um, with my niece, She's half Mexican, and I noticed one day that she was playing with a doll, and her doll had blonde hair and blue eyes, white skin, looked nothing like her, and I thought, huh, I wonder why that is. And after noticing that, I went to Target, and I noticed that the only dolls that they sell are blonde hair, blue eyes, or brown hair, brown eyes, white dolls, and it hit me in the face. This thing I didn't even know that was right in front of me. Why is my half-Mexican niece only playing with white dolls? 
What is she going to think about herself, about the beauty of being part Latina when she grows up? Is she going to think that it's a detriment? Is she going to think that only blonde-haired, blue-eyed dolls are cute and pretty? I tend to wrap myself in this neat little bubble to help protect me from the evils of life so that when I don't realize something, it's usually because I've made myself this nice little protective shell. And when I wrap myself in a bubble, I tend to minimize the problems of the world around me or not to notice them at all. It's a protection mechanism. So that when someone who is suffering says something about that suffering, something that I didn't notice, my first reaction is usually to deny that there's a problem because I haven't noticed it. The other reaction a reaction that I think we saw in the aftermath of the Michael Brown death in our community is sometimes anger because somebody has put my bubble under threat. It showed us something that we had neatly packed outside of our bubble and protected ourselves from. If not realizing there is a problem is a thing that you'd like to tackle this Lent, You don't have to begin by solving the world's problems. You don't have to fix the woes or everything when it seems out of kilter. It doesn't have to be an immediate switch. What I would say is if this is the thing that you're dealing with this Lent, if you would like to see the problems that you don't know exist, then work on the art of noticing. Don't beat yourself up when you notice. Just notice. Allow suffering to speak. Allow yourself to honestly notice the things that you need to repent of without judging yourself. Just notice. Now this leads us into our second obstacle because if you have noticed, then the next step is doing something about it if that's the, if that's the step in the process you are on. If you've noticed it and you want to fix it, then the next step is to do something. Now, this problem is summed up, I think, well by St. Augustine when he says, please, Lord, make me to be pure, but not yet. I still have plenty of cool things to do. I think this is the one that I'm guilty of most often. This is also the one that becomes an issue after I've turned from noticing to trying to rectify the problem. This is when my excuses come out. And all of my excuses hinge on two things. Either I minimize the problem so that it's not that big of a deal, or I minimize my ability to do anything about it. Now the beginning of the solution to this problem is more non-judgmental honesty with myself. I could fall into the trap of beating myself up about it, but that just reinforces the notion that this is too hard for me, and I don't want to fall into that trap. Or the way that it sounds during Lent, well, I've already missed a couple of days, so that's kind of out the window. I've messed this year's resolution up already, so I might as well just give up. It obviously wasn't meant to be. Now, when I run into the problem of excuses, I need to forgive myself for my inability to do it all right now, but also to continue like the little train that could, taking toys over the mountain to the children on the other side. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Because really, the issue that most keeps me in excuses mode is not that I really can't do something, but the fact that I fear that it might actually work which leads us to the third obstacle. Psalm 125 says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. I think this is one of the fears that's behind (coughs) this third obstacle. I don't know what the other side of change looks like. I don't know what I have to give up. Is this going to change who I am? Do I really want to give that up? I was watching a television show that really brought this kind of to the fore for me. A lady was sitting there and the interviewer asked her, you have this really significant thing that you could change. 
If you could wake up tomorrow morning and it would be changed, would you do it? And she said, no, because I, didn't, I wouldn't know who I am. I've always been this way. And furthermore, she said, She said, I would have to completely change my lifestyle in order to not get back to the place where I started. And that's a kind of death. Change is, a can be, a kind of death. But the good news in this obstacle is our covenant with God. When you look at the story of Noah... And you look at this as the prefiguring of baptism, or even if you don't look at it as the prefiguring of baptism, as Peter suggests. The whole land was flooded, and God said, I will never do this again. I will never cover you up. I will not destroy you. You will come through this to the other side. And the significant thing for us, if you do look at this as a prefiguring of baptism, is that when you go under the water, Because Jesus died and was resurrected, you know you will come back out of the water. You will be changed. You have to give something up to go into the water. Now, my father was an alcoholic. And if you want to talk about making a change in life, addiction is one of the places that's the most difficult to change. And my dad told me, When I wanted to change, first I had to realize that there was a problem. I didn't think there was a problem. I didn't think this was a coping mechanism. And when I decided that it was a problem and that I had to change or die, I knew that something needed to be done. And it couldn't be halfway. My dad was a bartender and a wine salesman for his entire life. And he had to give that up. Sometimes you have to give up friends if those friends are leading you into the same kind of lifestyle that you've been living. He didn't know what to expect, but he's been sober for eight years. And he knows still to this day that it's ongoing. He had to change his lifestyle and keep it going because if he walks into a bar, even if he doesn't drink the first time, eventually he will. It's a change of lifestyle, and that's scary. It changes who you are. But it changes who you can become, too. Baptism and rebirth is an important theme in Lent because it's about trusting God's promise not to destroy us. Peter said that when Jesus became a spirit, he went to the other spirits who had disobeyed and brought them the good news. If he will do that for the spirits who disobeyed, what will he do for us? I will trust in the Lord, as the old spiritual says. I will trust in the Lord. He is my sure defense. And I have one more bit of good news. God is Emmanuel. God is with us. And by virtue of eating the bread and wine at this table, the body of Christ is spread throughout the room. God is with us, and part of God's body is sitting next to you. If you need help, if you need to be held accountable, if you need somebody to listen, if you need your suffering to speak, God is with you. Amen.